In this lesson, we're going to look at covalent bonding. The first aim is to describe how simple molecules form through covalent bonding, then explain the importance of intermolecular forces, and then finally describe and explain the properties of giant covalent structures, as well as a bit of exam application. We are surrounded by simple molecules such as water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. And like all things which are found everywhere, we tend to take them for granted. But I just wanted to share some remarkable properties these simple molecules have. So in this video, I'm reacting acid with bicarbonate of soda, and that's producing carbon dioxide gas over here. And when I blow bubbles on it, you can see that the bubbles actually sit in midair. You can actually do this quite easily at home using vinegar and bicarbonate of soda. The point is, carbon dioxide is a very dense gas, and therefore it will sink to the bottom of this container. And air is less dense than carbon dioxide, so the bubbles rest upon the carbon dioxide layer as if it was sitting on an invisible table. <laughs> also, carbon dioxide can be used oh, to put out fires. It's so dense you can pour it like a liquid. Do you see that? Water is another astonishing simple molecule. I mean, firstly, when they form snowflakes, every crystal is unique. I think that's incredible. But even more so is the fact that when water freezes, unlike most liquids, it expands. And through expanding, it becomes less dense than its liquid form. Have you ever stopped to think how unusual that is? I mean, normally when something freezes, it takes up less space, becomes more dense, and sinks to the bottom of its liquid form. I mean, just imagine putting solid chocolate in liquid chocolate. It would sink to the bottom. Not water, though. Water becomes less dense as it freezes, and that's because it expands and takes up a greater volume. But if it wasn't for this property, the polar bears would have nowhere to tread on. And also, water is a solvent of so many chemicals. So many things can dissolve into water, such as salts. So, so far, we've looked at ionic bonding, and that's when a metal atom transfers an electron or a number of electrons to a non-metal atom, forming a positively charged metal ion and a positively charged non-metal ion, and because they're opposite charges, they attract each other. So, ionic bonding occurs when electrons are transferred from one atom to another. A covalent bond, however, forms between non-metal atoms, and this time they don't transfer electrons, but they share electrons. So in covalent bonding, electrons are shared. But it's really important that you define covalent bonding in the right way, using the right language. So a covalent bond forms when non-metals share pairs of electrons. Don't forget that word, that's really important. If you had to describe covalent bonding for two marks, you get one mark for saying sharing electrons, but you must say pairs to get the second mark, so sharing pairs of electrons. So let's start off by looking at simple covalent molecules and how they covalently bond. There are six examples you need to know for the exam. First, let's look at how hydrogen atoms bond covalently to form a hydrogen molecule, H2. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one. That means it has one proton in its nucleus, but also one electron in its shell. The first shell is complete with two electrons. Now in the first atom, I've drawn the electron as a pink X and the second one as a dot. They are both still electrons exactly the same. I'm just letting you know where it's coming from. When you draw covalent bond diagrams, you must use dot and cross diagrams. So anyway, hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell and its first shell only has one shell and the first shell is complete with two electrons. So all they need is an extra electron. So this is what they do. They share electrons like this. Now, this pair of electrons counts for the both of them. So this hydrogen atom has one, two electrons, and it's got a complete outer shell. And this one has one, two electrons, and has a complete outer shell. So hydrogen share one pair of electrons. This is how you draw it in an exam. You can also write it like this, with a capital H for hydrogen and a little line to represent the single bond that they share. Next, you need to know hydrogen chloride, which is a gas. It's a simple covalent molecule. It's a gas, but when you bubble it into water, it makes hydrochloric acid. So here we have one hydrogen atom, which will share its outer electron with chlorine. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell and therefore needs one more. Therefore, it needs to share one pair of electrons, same as hydrogen. Chlorine will have a shell underneath with two electrons, but you don't have to draw that in covalent bond diagrams. You only need to draw the outer shell. So hydrogen and chlorine do this. They're sharing one pair of electrons, so hydrogen now has one, two, its complete outer shell, and chlorine has two, four, six, eight, also complete and stable. Similarly, we draw H with a single bond with a Cl, because they share a single bond. So remember, they're sharing one pair of electrons. 
Next we have methane, CH4. Carbon has four electrons on its outer shell, therefore needs four more. So it needs to share four pairs of electrons. And this is how it does it with hydrogen. One pair, two pairs, three pairs, four pairs. Notice how every hydrogen atom now shares one pair of electrons and has two electrons in its outer shell. So they're all complete. And carbon now has eight electrons in its outer shell because it's sharing four pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can also represent it by using this symbol. So carbon shares four single bonds with hydrogen. And now we'll look at water. Oxygen has six electrons on its outer shell, therefore needs two more to complete its outer shell. Therefore, it needs to share two pairs of electrons. Hydrogen, as you know, needs two but only has one, so they each need to share one pair of electrons. So, as you might expect, this solves the problem. Oxygen shares two pairs of electrons, one with each hydrogen atom, and hydrogen shares one pair of electrons. And if you do the count, two, four, six, eight for oxygen, and two each for hydrogen. You can write it like this as well. Now the two you need to know for the higher level, oxygen, and the only reason this is slightly more complex, and I do mean slightly, is because they share two pairs of electrons rather than one. Each oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell, so they need to share two pairs of electrons to add the two more to make eight. So they do this. So now each oxygen has two, four, six, eight electrons and the same for the other one. That's why a molecule of oxygen is written as O2. Notice how the diagram's different this time. I have two lines because they're sharing two pairs of electrons, two bonds here. And finally, carbon dioxide. Carbon has four electrons, so it needs four more. So it needs to share four pairs. Oxygen needs two more, so we'll share two pairs. And this is how they bond covalently. So you can see now carbon shares one pair, two pair, three pair, four pairs of electrons and has eight electrons on its outer shell. And oxygen shares one pair, two pair here and one pair, two pair here. So they have eight electrons on their outer shell. Notice how you draw the diagram here. Two double bonds linking to the carbon from each oxygen, CO2. So here are all the simple covalent molecules you need to know in one page so you can pause this and just make note of them. You may be asked to draw any one of these in the exam, but these two are for the higher paper only. And that is how you describe how simple molecules form through covalent bonding. So simple covalent molecules, as you may have gathered, have kind of very finite looking structures. They don't sprawl on forever like ionic compounds, which have positive, negative, positive, negative ions. And you could just extend that on and on and on. But simple covalent molecules have a definite finite shape. And because of their structure, they have unique properties that you need to know. Remember, a chemist's job is to work out the structure of something and then relate that to how it behaves. So simple covalent molecules are usually a gas or a liquid at room temperature though some soft solids can also be um, simple covalent molecules. Because they involve the bonding of atoms and not ions, they do not have charged particles and therefore cannot conduct electricity, no ions. And obviously, if they're gas and liquid at room temperature, then they're going to have a low boiling point. But there's a lot to say about this. You see, different covalent molecules have different boiling points. Why is that? Well, when a living organism breathes out, they breathe out water vapour and carbon dioxide. And if you were to blow onto a mirror you'd find condensation. Now this is water vapour, but you won't get droplets of carbon dioxide on there. Why not? Well, quite simply, it's because water has a higher boiling point than carbon dioxide, but why does it have a higher boiling point? In other words, the surface temperature of the mirror is cold enough to condense water, turn it from a gas back into a liquid, but it's not cold enough to condense carbon dioxide. In other words, turn that from a gas to a liquid. That's why carbon dioxide has a much lower boiling point than water. Here's the explanation for it. You see, covalent bonds between atoms are incredibly strong. So the bonds between the oxygen and the carbon here and the oxygen and the hydrogen here are very, very, very strong. And you need to invest a lot of energy to try and separate those atoms. But the force of attraction between carbon dioxide molecules, in other words, intermolecular forces, inter meaning between molecular molecules, so between molecule forces, the forces between the molecules, are much weaker and determine a chemical's boiling point. So the intermolecular forces between carbon dioxide molecules are weaker than the intermolecular forces between water molecules. So if we're in a hot room right now and these carbon dioxide molecules are moving around and then we cool down the room, what's going to happen is they won't have as much energy and that force of attraction between the molecules will kick in and they'll hold each other. But as you can see, water has stronger forces of attraction between the molecules, stronger intermolecular forces. So it doesn't need to be quite as cold 
for the force of attraction to basically overcome the energy in the particles and cause them to basically bond together. So let's tie this all together. I've got a thermometer here and we're starting in a room at minus 100 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, carbon dioxide is present as a liquid and water is obviously very much frozen as a solid. So let's start increasing the temperature. And at first, carbon dioxide is liquid, but when we get to minus 78.5 degrees Celsius, well, that is the evaporation point of carbon dioxide. Here, it will turn from a liquid to a gas. In other words, carbon dioxide boils at this temperature because it has relatively weak intermolecular forces. Water is still very much frozen. So let's continue. At this point, you can see now we're at zero degrees Celsius. This is the melting point of water where it will turn from the solid to a liquid. Carbon dioxide is still a gas, obviously, and will remain a gas as long as we keep increasing the temperature. And then water will stay as a liquid until we get to 100 degrees Celsius, and now we have enough energy to overcome those intermolecular forces, and the water molecules separate completely and evaporate off. My point is, intermolecular forces determine a chemical's boiling point. The stronger the intermolecular forces are, the higher the boiling point. Remember that. So remember, carbon dioxide has a lower boiling point than water because it has weaker intermolecular forces. This comes up quite a lot in exams. One critical error students make is they use the term weak intermolecular forces to describe the boiling points and melting points of ionic compounds and giant covalent structures. These structures are not molecules, so you cannot say intermolecular forces. So if you use the term weak intermolecular forces or strong intermolecular forces with ionic compounds or ionic lattices or giant covalent structures, you will get no marks because it's technically very much incorrect. Only use it for simple covalent molecules. The clue is molecules, not lattice, not structure. So that's how you explain the importance of intermolecular forces. Finally, let's look at giant covalent structures. The most common ones you all know are diamond, graphite, and sand, silicon dioxide. But the ones you really need to focus on for this exam are diamond and graphite, especially from the higher paper. Well, giant covalent structures are very much like ionic lattices in that you get these huge sprawling structures in a regular arrangement of atoms. But it's the word atoms that makes it different from ionic lattices. They're not charged, they're not ions, they are atoms that are sharing electrons. They haven't lost or gained electrons to become charged. So they're like giant ionic lattices, but with atoms, not ions, no charge. Because of their super large size compared to simple molecules, they have a very high melting point. That's one of the key properties. No ions, so they do not conduct electricity, except for graphite. There's always exceptions. I'll explain that in a second. And they are insoluble in water, which you can imagine. You put diamond or you put sand in water or pencil lead, it's not going to dissolve. But a very popular exam question for six marks is comparing the structure and properties of diamond and graphite, where you relate their structure to their specific behavior. If you remember, carbon has four electrons on its outer shell. Therefore, it needs four more. Therefore, it needs to share four pairs of electrons, so it can it basically form four covalent bonds. In diamond, it does just that. The carbon atoms form four covalent bonds with other carbon atoms. So you can see here, one, two, three, four. Those which don't look like they're doing it is only because you can continue this structure on. I'm just showing you a section of it. Because of this, diamond is incredibly hard and rigid. In fact, it's amazing to think that diamond is basically the same matter. It's made of the same stuff as ash and soot and coal. You just need to place ash or soot or any form of carbon under a lot of pressure, and then you'll force the atoms to rearrange themselves to make diamond. In fact, in the film Superman 2, I think it is, uh, Superman basically picks up a lump of coal in his hand and crushes it really, really hard. And when he opens it, it's, you can see a diamond there, which he then gives to Lois Lane. That's just to show off how strong Superman is. Anyway, so very hard and rigid. They can use diamond for cutting other materials because it's so hard. But also, there are no free electrons, so it does not conduct electricity. Every electron is forming a pair with another electron. Graphite, which forms pencil lead or lubricants, for example, well, in graphite, each carbon atom forms three covalent bonds. So carbon has a potential to form four, but in graphite, it only forms three covalent bonds. You can see here's one, one, two, three. This means that it has a spare electron which can move so it can conduct electricity. So electrons can actually move through the structure of graphite, allowing it to conduct an electric current. This is why graphite is used to make electrodes, which you might have seen when doing electrolysis experiments. Also, the carbon atoms are arranged in layers. So you can see one layer, another layer, 
where there are weak forces of attraction, these dotted lines, between each layer, so the layers can slide over each other very easily. That's why pencil leaves a mark on paper as these layers slide off. And similarly, that's why you can use graphite as a lubricant, sort of slippery substance. So this table is a good example of exam application where you have to identify structures using the properties given in a table. This nicely ties together giant ionic lattices, giant covalent structures, and simple covalent molecules, and your understanding of each. All you have to do is look for the key signature properties. You see, the first one has a high melting point. Anything with hundreds degrees Celsius is going to be high and a much higher boiling point. It doesn't conduct electricity when solid, but does conduct electricity when liquid or aqueous, and it dissolves in water. It's water soluble. Whenever you see it doesn't conduct electricity when solid, but does when liquid or aqueous dissolved in solution, that should ring alarm bells. That is going to be a giant ionic lattice. The next one has a very low melting point, a relatively low boiling point, lower than water, doesn't conduct electricity, so it can't contain ions or charged particles, um, it doesn't conduct electricity when solid or liquid, and it doesn't dissolve in water. So that means because of its low boiling point and melting point, it must be a simple molecule. See if you can guess this one. So very high melting point, very high boiling point, doesn't conduct electricity when solid, doesn't conduct it when liquid or aqueous, and doesn't dissolve in water. Well, the key indicators here are the very high melting point, the fact it doesn't dissolve, it's insoluble and doesn't conduct electricity. It must be a giant covalent structure. See if you get this one. This one has an excessively high melting point, very high indeed, and a much higher boiling point, so much so that it was actually hard to find. It does conduct electricity when solid, it does conduct electricity when liquid, but it doesn't dissolve in water, so it doesn't form an aqueous solution. Well, this is a bit of an anomaly, because it has a high melting point, it's not water-soluble, so it's a giant covalent structure, but it does conduct electricity. Well, therefore, it must be a giant covalent structure, which is graphite. If you understand how to read this table, then it really will help you get some marks in the exams. And that is how you describe and explain the properties of giant covalent structures.